Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this talk with the absurdly ambitious title, <coughs> The Truth About Art. It's very good to see some familiar faces <coughs> in the company, and good in a different sense to see some new faces. Um, those of you who don't know me, my name's Patrick Dawley, and I normally teach art history programs in this department. Today, we're extending, or at least I'm extending my range into the treacherous field of philosophy. Um, truth is the field of philosophy, and philosophers have said quite a lot about art. Um, but I perhaps ought to say right from the word go that I'm adopting an art historian's um, approach to philosophy, putting things in a historical context. So I'm going to start by saying a few words about truth, um, then about art, and then I'm going to tackle the main theme of this first talk, mystery or mastery. That's not meant to be mysterious. It actually refers to Sir Ernst Gombrich's um, famous statement in, in the opening of his book, The Truth About Art. <laughs> not The Truth About Art, that's my book. I beg his pardon. Um, the Story of Art, um, which opens with the famous sentence, there really is no such thing as art. <clears throat> so that is the mystery. Um, the mastery is the answer he didn't give to the... the he said that art with a capital A um, doesn't exist, art with a little a does, and that is mastery. So that is the key to the, the, these two words. Um, the subtitle of my book, The Truth About Art, is Reclaiming Quality. Quality is the missing ingredient, I am going to suggest, that makes art into a mystery. <coughs> Well, let's start by having a look at truth. <clears throat> this is truth. Um, it's not any old truth. It's the truth that presides over the ceremonial heart of the university. Um, the ceiling of the Sheldonian Theatre has um, all the arts and sciences looking up to heaven and appealing, imploring truth to come down and enlighten the university. And if you go to the Sheldonian, perhaps you could pop there at lunchtime and you look at the um, ceiling, this is what you'll see. Not quite as large as this, this is obviously um, taken close up. So you can see, um, I think it's a female figure, a li little bit ambiguous perhaps, but I think it's a female figure. She's holding a palm of victory in one hand and looking towards the sun. <coughs> Every undergraduate that matriculated in this university, um, whether they knew it or not, was under the eye of this personification of truth. And the personification, of course, is the key. This isn't truth. This is a painting of a personification of the concept of truth. And the cultural practice of personifying abstract concepts, we know, comes from the ancient Greeks. So... I'm going to have a quick look at a, um, a Greek work of art to help us place this approach to um, visual imagery in its historical context. Now, this is a very famous um, red figure painted pot, um, a crater. Uh, it shows the death of Sarpedon. It was for many years, no, well, for some years, in the Metro Metropolitan Museum in New York, and it had a, a slightly ambiguous pedigree. And um, more recently, the Metropolitan Museum has returned it to Italy, and you see it in the Villa Giulia in Rome today. Um, so this is a scene from the Iliad, um, book 16 of the Iliad, when the hero Sarpedon, who was Zeus's son, um, has been killed in battle. Now, Zeus knows everything. Uh, uh, the gods know the past, the present, and the future. And he knew that his beloved son was going to be killed. And it grieved him, so he was sorely tempted to intervene. And his consort, Hera, um, was deeply unsettled by this. And she said to Zeus, well, you can do that if you like, but think of the example you're setting to the other gods. If they started intervening um, and saving their favorite mortals from um, death or other danger, the whole cosmos would become disorganized. Far better, um, Hera said, is to let Sarpedon fight, he will fall in battle, and then let 
death and sleep pick him up and carry him to his home in wide Lycia where his kinsfolk will bury him with the proper ceremony and array, um, raise a monument over his tomb, as is proper for mortals. So that is what Zeus decides to do. And it's a wonderful image. Um, we know sleep as a condition which all animals have to adopt on a regular basis, and death is the cessation of life. Um, both are as real as real can be. But to talk about them as beings who can carry out instructions, that is a trick of language which is wonderful um, from the words of a poet. And the challenge to the painter, and this pot is signed by the painter Euphronius, a famous um, late 6th century BC Attic pot painter, the challenge was to um, make these beings visible. So you can see what he's done. Um, on the left and right, there are two hoplites dressed in contemporary armor of the 6th century BC with their helmets over their heads. They're winged, and that indicates that they're a little bit special. And coming out of the mouth of the one on the right, I don't know if you can read this, um, Thanatos, um, reading from right to left, that's death, and Hupnos, from um, left to right, that sleep, they are lifting up the, um, the body of the hero Sarpedon. And what a wonderful body that is. This is a youth in all his um, beauty and strength, um, his quality, if you like, brought low in death, and his body, the beauty of his body and its obvious strength is expressing those qualities that have lost, been lost with his death. So it's a poignant image um, from a, um, a poignant passage in the Iliad which um, the, the pot painter has visualized. Now I'm going to invite you to think of truth in this context. context. Um, true, true or false as an adjective is an uncomplicated word. It qualifies a sentence or the answer to a question. Um, I'm standing while you're sitting. That is a true um, statement. Um, if you ask me, did I have coffee for breakfast, and I say yes, that is a true answer to your question. So true and false uh, as adjectives don't present any philosophical problems, but truth as an abstraction, as a noun, has um, tormented philosophers for two and a half thousand years. Um, the earliest reference to it comes from the pre-Socratic Xenophanes of Colophon, and he said that no man has seen truth, um, and if any of us happens to speak truth, we don't know it. How would we know if what we have spoken represents truth? It is um, a verbal conceit, perhaps, like um, death and sleep in um, Homer's image in the Iliad. Now, this was put very eloquently by a contemporary of um, the painter of the um, ceiling in the Sheldonian. Robert Streeter is the painter. He painted it um, in the late 1660s, finished by um, 1670. And this comes from Thomas Hobbes, um, the magnificent Hobbes who wrote the Leviathan in 1651. This was during the, um, the Great Rebellion, as it was called, the Civil War in England. And he said, um, true and false are attributes of speech, not of things. And where speech is not, there is neither truth nor falsehood. Words are wise men's counters. They do but reckon with them, but they are the money of fools. True and false belongs to the world of symbolic notation, to language. And I suspect that Hobbes has got this from Aristotle. Um, Aristotle is usually commenting on Plato and Socrates in many of his statements. And on this subject, he said that in, in practical matters, in the here and now, we have to be content to learn what is true about about these things, roughly and in outline and for the most part. And he goes on to say, for it is the mark of an educated person to look for precision in each kind of inquiry just to the extent that the nature of the subject allows it. 
So you wouldn't expect, um, if you asked me, did I have uh, coffee for breakfast, for the kind of answer that you might get from mathematics, which is, as Aristotle said, um, a field in which things cannot be otherwise. Truth, um, Aristotle claimed, belongs to the field of theoretical knowledge, not um, the field of doing or making, in matters which cannot be otherwise. Um, and in, in, in subjects such as logic, metaphysics, mathematics, and natural science, we can establish knowledge which is universal, necessary, unchanging, separable from matter, involving proof and reason, and which can be taught. Um, that is the field of truth, not the practical um, situations that we encounter in daily life. And I think this was common in ancient societies um, before philosophy. Um, Socrates lived in the 5th century BC. Um, that statement from Xenophanes that no one has ever encountered truth dates from about 500 BC. Before then, truth isn't an issue, and I don't think it's an issue in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Um, I'm showing you this reference from um, the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve going for the apple. Um, when um, God made paradise and made, I'm quoting now from Genesis, made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge. He didn't say of truth and falsehood, he said knowledge of good and evil. It's the realm of values which early poets and early um, religious um, teachers were concerned with. They wanted to instruct their peoples, their communities, in right conduct, how to behave rather than in verbal statements of truth or falsehood. It's in the New Testament that you have the concept of truth being introduced. And St. Paul, I think, is the figure who does that. Um, the book of Galatians, his letter to the Galatians, is possibly the first um, Christian document to survive. And immediately is having a go at people for getting truth wrong. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Well, the poor Galatians didn't know what the truth was. Um, Paul had preached them his gospel, and it seems, if we read between the lines, that another group of apostles had arrived in Galatia and told them that they had to keep the Jewish law. And Paul's angle was that all they needed to do was believe his gospel, and um, that was his truth. But there was a fierce debate amongst the first Christians whether they had to follow the Jewish law or not. And if you put that in um, the realm of truth, there is no way of settling the argument. Um, that probably, Paul's letters are, were written before any of the Gospels. The last of the Gospels is probably St. John's Gospel. And it's there that truth really features throughout. Um, in fact, the Jesus in John's Gospel has a distinctive way of speaking. Um, we know it is verily, verily, I say, it unto you, I say unto you, Amen, Amen, Legoi Soi, um, is the Greek. Um, amen, Amen is the closest Hebrew word that I'm told exists to the equivalent of um, aletheia, truth, in um, Greek. And it's something like, um, it's an affirmation. Um, certainly. And there's an even more um, evocative passage when Christ is before Pilate. Um, Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king, for, for this I was born and for this I came in, into the world to testify to the truth. And then Pilate asks him this very big question, what is truth? And we're on the edge of our chairs. We're dying for an answer. Answer this and 2,000 years of philosophy would be settled. But it's a rhetorical question. Um, Pilate is saying, what is truth? As if no one can tell us what truth is. There is no answer. And that is what the writer of John's Gospel, I think, um, had assumed. It's a rhetorical question. So, <clears throat> 
Truth as an abstract con concept, I think, is problematic. Um, true and false as adjectives, qualifying statements and questions, I think, uh, is straightforward. Um, let's now shift to the question of art, the truth about art. Um, if you go into the Sheldonian, you look up at the ceiling, this is the larger um, canvas or the series of canvases that you see. So we were looking at the little detail in the, in the center of the ceiling, uh, the figure of truth, and surrounding truth are all the arts and the sciences. Uh, we have a wonderful description by one Dr. Plot, um, written in the 1670s, a description of Oxfordshire in which he describes the ceiling. And the conceit clearly is that this is an open-air um, theatre. People knew that Roman theatres were open to the skies, so the framework, the timber framework, has been cut to look like rope. And there's a, a velarium, a, an awning that could be dragged over the ropes to protect the spectators from the sun, from direct light from the sun. So the awning has been um, drawn back, revealing the heavens above, and these are all the arts and the sciences, according to Dr. Plot. But they are not the arts that we would um, refer to as arts, and in fact, Dr. Plot doesn't distinguish arts from sciences. They, they include <coughs> what in the, liberal, in the Middle Ages were referred to as liberal arts. Um, if I zoom in a little bit, and look at the bottom here. Um, this is the figure of, of law or justice. Um, she is seat, seated with a scepter, and this is the figure of rhetoric on her side. Th these are arts, apparently, or are they sciences? We don't know. Rhetoric traditionally was an, uh, was a, was an art, the art of persuasion. And you look at that rather buxom young woman, bare-chested, and you can think that um, an Oxford undergraduate in 1670 would be immediately persuaded by that art of rhetoric. <clears throat> um, strangely, above her, there is the art of printing. Um, we're actually looking at printing's armpit there and looking up uh, printing's nostrils. It's a personification of printing. Law needed printed texts and it needs the fascists there to enforce its judgments. Um, architecture features on the left here. There's a Corinthian capital and a plumb line and an architect square and a pair of dividers. Um, architecture was not uh, an art taught in, in the university, as indeed it, it isn't today. Um, perhaps it got in because Sir Christopher Wren obviously designed the Sheldonian and that gave it a certain prestige. If we walk around <clears throat> and look up to the central figure here, this is theology. Um, the queen of the sciences, according to medieval assumptions, um, she is um, flanked by um, the Jewish law and the Christian Gospels. And this is history. Um, I'm glad to see that history is looking at truth. <laughs> She's got her, um, her pen, her, her, her quill pen raised, um, being guided by truth, and every historian needs uh, a research assistant. <laughs> <laughs> there is a little... Um, Dr. Plot referred to them as genie, which is the word for a spirit. Our word genius obviously comes from the Latin word for a spirit, but at this state it still referred to a spirit. It didn't mean for a super talented individual. So these arts and sciences include theology, law, um, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, astrology, music. The arts that we uh, um, assume we, we have as our reference when we're talking about the arts are actually what in the 18th century were defined as the fine arts, the beaux-arts, um, painting, sculpture and architecture, um, music and literature. They had not yet been codified. So there are conventions involved here and history can separate out when particular conventions are adopted. In antiquity, the philosophers muddled up the, um, the sciences and the arts. They thought of, uh, the philosophers thought of them as bodies of knowledge. And I'm suggesting to you that before the philosophers, every activity was an art insofar it could be done well or badly. That's going to be my thesis. Well, where is Streeter's art in this ceiling? 
Streeter is the painter who's painted it. Um, he doesn't feature. Painting is not one of the arts looking up to truth. Um, we suspect that Robert Streeter looked at um, a sort of Wikipedia for his personifications, a uh, 17th century uh, Wikipedia. This is Econologia, um, a, a textbook of different personifications, and this is the one for truth, Verita. And there you can see um, an almost nude figure holding a palm, just like um, Streeter's um, Truth is holding a, a palm frond and looking at the sun. And the text says, Una bellissima donna ignuda, the um, most beautiful um, nude woman, and it tells us something about um, her qualities. Streeter's art is to transform the engraving which you see on the left into the painting you see on the right. It's an invisible art if you haven't got your concepts ready to see them. It's not a personification, it's how he does something. Um, art is a Latin word for skill. And Streeter has taken a standing figure resting one hand, sorry, one foot on the globe into this seated figure foreshortened from a very acute angle so that we can be looking up at her and the arts um, surrounding her can be looking up at her. And we know from George Virtue, who was an 18th century collector of anecdotes of English painters, that this was Streeter's um, famous um, ability, um, perspective and foreshortening. Um, Virtue referred to him as a complete master in these particular skills. And we suspect that he would have used um, a device such as um, Dura illustrated here, a frame with a, um, a transparent fine fabric with threads creating a grid, an equivalent um, grid on a piece of paper, so that with your eye in a fixed position, you can trace the outlines of a figure where it crosses the grid and transfer them to your um, paper like that. And that's how he got his foreshortening right. We suspect, obviously, we don't actually know. That is a skill. Um, it doesn't need a personification. You recognize it if you have the right reference. Well, um, we shift from that to the question of mystery. Why did this become mysterious? Why is a skill, something that can be done well or badly, so problematic? And I think that the philosophers have something to be answered um, for here. And in particular, um, Plato and Plato Socrates. This is the famous statement from the Apology, um, Socrates' defense when he was on trial for his life in 399 BC. Um, Socrates, 70 years old, facing um, the jury of 501 citizens of Athens, and he has to put up his defense. And this is the statement that we are often um, quoted. It is the greatest good for a man to discuss virtue every day, for the unexamined life is not worth living. Now that clearly is taken out of context. Um, there's a larger context here in which um, Socrates asks, why don't you just shut up? Um, if you just keep quiet and stop pestering people about what is virtue, um, let the craftsmen, let the sophists and the rhetoricians get on with their jobs, leave people in peace, in, in peace um, there'll be no trouble. But you keep going around pestering people. And Socrates, this is Socrates' answer. He can't, he says, um, stop asking this, this question, or he would be disobeying the god. <clears throat> and by the god, he might mean um, the uh, Apollo in Delphi, who said that Socrates was the wisest of men, or it could be his own daimon, his own inner genius, his conscience, we might say. And the larger text, he says, I can't disobey the god, so I, I've got to keep asking these questions. Um, even though you don't believe me that I've got a God telling me this, this is the case. And if I say that it is the greatest good for a man to discuss arete every day, and those other things about which you hear me conversing and testing myself and others, for the unexamined life is not worth living for men, you will believe me even less. This is a very odd thing to do, and Socrates is telling the jury of 501 citizens that 
you, you won't believe this, but this is what I think I have to do. Discuss arete every day. So the question is, what does arete mean? It's traditionally translated as virtue because when it was first translated into Latin, it was translated as virtus, um, which is um, a Latin word which has become our modern virtue, but we reserve it for moral excellence, <coughs> and the ancient Romans used it for excellence across the board. Um, and that is one of the roots of the, con the confusion. Um, modern translation, translators of Plato and Aristotle very often use excellence for arete. They, they've dropped virtue and they use excellence. But I don't think that quite works, <clears throat> because why would Socrates go around Athens asking people what excellence is? It's not difficult. Excellence is a, a superlative. <clears throat> And if you ask a potter what excellence is, and you say, well, it's the best possible pot I could, I could produce. And if we had a pot competition, and the best pot would be excellent. Is that so difficult? Does he have to spend his life asking people what excellence is? So I suspect there's a bit more to it than that. And the key has in my judgment, come from this celebrated book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persick. Published in 1974 and ignored over the last how many years it is, 40 odd years, by philosophers, art historians and academics. Um, so we're going to give it a little bit of attention today. The um, theme of Persig's book is not Zen, not Zen Buddhism, and it's not motorcycle maintenance. The key is in the subtitle. It's an inquiry into values. And values is what the author of um, Genesis was concerned with, and values is what Homer is concerned with, the difference between the good and the bad. Um, Persig is not concerned with truth and falsehood. He's concerned with the good and the bad. And the story that he tells, we haven't got time, obviously, to go into it, but the, 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 the key moment was when he was teaching English composition in a teaching um, college in America, and one of his senior colleagues um, said to him, I hope you're teaching quality. And he said, sure, um, I'm certainly teaching quality. Um, everyone would have answered in the same way. But then Persig asked, him, asked himself, what, did it, he had, what is meant by quality? And being um, an extremely in, intelligent individual, very highly educated, um, brought up in universities, his father was a dean of law in a university, and as a child, he sat in a, on all the lectures um, in, a, in the university, extremely well educated, extremely intelligent. He wouldn't let go on this question, what is quality? And at a key moment, he referred to the um, Platonic Dialogues. Pop quality into the answer, and the meaning of the Platonic Dialogues is transformed. So let's read um, Socrates' statement to the jury again. If I say that the greatest good for a man is to, dis is to discuss quality every day, um, and those other things which you hear me conversing and testing myself and others for the unexamined life is not worth living for men, you will believe me in even less. They will believe him even less, not because they're uninterested in quality. Arete is the key value in Homeric Greece, and Homer set the standard, the values, for Greeks in the archaic and classical period. The odd thing is to go about discussing it rather than just doing it. <clears throat> if you're a potter or a soldier or a public speaker or a um, um, a helmsman sailing a ship, you want to get things right and you're concerned with quality. It is wanting to define it, to discuss it, to put it into words, which was odd in um, Socrates' conduct. Socrates wanted to pin it down with knowledge and to make, put it into words, and that doesn't work. So let's um, see if we can discover the meaning of arete by looking at earlier text, um, Homer obviously uh, in particular.
Um, this is um, a passage from Book 8 in the Iliad. Hector is retiring um, for the day and he's um, addressing the Trojans about the following day's encounter. So he says that in the following day, I will know whether the son of Tudius, mighty Diomedes, will thrust me back from the ships to the wall, or whether I will slay him with the bronze and carry off his blood-stained spoil. Tomorrow he will come to know his quality, whether he can face the approach of my spear. You wouldn't use virtue for quality there. Um, you could use excellence. Um, you could use a number of words, but quality is an all-embracing word. It's not just courage, it's not just skill, it's everything. I think quality in that context works um, particularly well. But it isn't just heroes fighting in battle that Homer uses the word arete for. Um, this is Penelope. Um, Penelope had been left by Odysseus um, for ten years when he was fighting in the Trojan War, and ten more years when he was trying to find his way home and kept getting lost. So Penelope is surrounded by suitors who want to marry her, and a suitor says of, Pen of Penelope, we on our part are waiting here day after day, continue our rivalry for that quality of hers. And do not go after other women whom each one could fitly wed. What is the quality that was important for a woman in this early period of Greek history, the, the sort of colonizing period, probably the 8th century um, BC? Well, this was a great seafaring culture. The Greeks were expanding all over the Mediterranean, setting up trading posts and colonies. So husbands would be away from their wives for years at a time. And obviously they could have shipwrecks and they could die and they could um, never come back. How long is a woman to wait for her husband in those circumstances? Um, well, a couple of years, perhaps, perhaps three or four years, and a, you know, a very loyal um, wife might wait four or five. Um, but she has a young son, and her father is, uh, sorry, her stepfather is too old to protect her. She has flocks, she has sheep, she has swine, she has property, which is attractive for other men, and she's obviously vulnerable, and she's a target. So how long does she hold out for? Well, Penelope held out for ten years while Odysseus was fighting, and she's held out for ten more years while he's trying to get home. And her quality is such that they are still um, clustering around her, as moths might cluster around a candle. And this was a quality held up by Homer um, to be admired by his audience. Um, you read Homer with, with an eye to this, and you find that this is what Homer cares about most. It is quality that concerns him. So um, Odysseus has a swine herd, <clears throat> and he looks after his swine for 20 years, and the suitors are eating up his, um, his pigs. Um, and when Sir Odysseus finally returns, you, you remember that he's in disguise, and he sees his old dog. You remember that rather wonderful episode, Argos? And it, he was a wonderful hunting dog, um, fleet of foot, um, strong, loyal. And he sees this old dog, and he's a mangy, old, neglected creature on a compost heap. And um, Odysseus is shocked to see Argos in that condition. And Argos, of course, um, recognizes Odysseus. He's the only one who recognizes his master. Um, and Odysseus says to Eumaeus, his swineherd, how, how could they have neglected Argos in this way? And um, Eumaeus explains that it's the, the, the slave women in the household who are looking after him, or supposed to be looking after him. And then he says, for Zeus, whose voice is born afar, takes away half the quality from a man when the day of slavery comes upon him. These are slaves who are looking after the dog, and they just do what they're told. They don't use their judgment. If they're told just to give him some scraps, that's what they do. They don't care. 
And surely you can apply this across the board. How many of us are, have been in a situation in which we're not allowed to use our judgment? We just have to um, meet targets or meet outputs. Um, the, is it the barristers who were on strike yesterday because they don't like the new arrangements? When they can't use their judgment to serve their clients, they've got to... Um, deliver within a particular budget, within a particular time frame. So it's a, a kind of form of slavery. That is what destroys people. I think that is what Homer is saying there. Um, we move on a little bit later to Hesiod, um, perhaps a century or so after Homer. Obviously, we don't know exactly. And he um, makes this very famous remark. Badness can be got easily and in shoals. The road, the road to her is smooth and she lives very near us. But between us and quality, the gods have paced placed the sweat of our brows. Long and steep is the path that leads to her, and it is rough at first. But when a man has reached the top, then she is easy to reach, though before she was hard. You, can, you, you wouldn't translate um, arete as courage or um, various other words that have been used. I suppose you might um, translate it as virtue. But virtue is a rather more specialist word. Quality is being good at whatever it is that you have to do. And I think it fits this passage very nicely. Why am I talking about this in, um, on a day in which our theme is the truth about art? Well, this is a connection which Persig also has taught us. The Latin word art, which I say I've always been able to translate a skill, and, and the um, translation works very well, has an Indo-European Indo root, A-R-T, which appears in Latin as ars and in Greek as arete. It's the same root. In Germanic languages, it reappears as recht or right. And I believe that in Sanskrit, it reappears as the word, I don't know how you pronounce it, Rita, I say. All these words have a common ancient, preliterate, in the proto-European root, A-R-T. Right is something that's very important to us. And we don't go around defining it because it is so various. Right in one context wouldn't be right in another context. And it's not just a context, it's a time and a place and the particular situation. It is particular, it, it can't be generalized. And that applies for arete and for ours. Um, and above all, <laughs> it applies... The, the, the point that Persig makes, and I think Homer makes it too, is that you can't put quality into words. You can't put the beauty of a young woman into words. How many poets um, have tried to say, to describe their beloved in words and failed? And the most famous beauty of all, Helen of Troy, um, how did she become so famous as a beauty? Homer never describes her. The closest he comes is this particular passage when the old men of Troy are on the walls of Troy looking at, down at the battle and Helen approaches her, sorry, Helen approaches them and softly the old men of Troy spoke winged words to one another. Small blame that Trojans and well-grieved Archaeans should for such a woman suffer, long suffer woes. She is terribly like an immortal goddess to look on. It's old men who are saying this, presumably those whose um, sort of um, sexual appetites are a little bit cooler than that of younger men, and even they um, recognize the extraordinary beauty of Helen. And that is enough for Homer to have established Helen's wonderful beauty. You can't define beauty um, any more than you can define quality. And this is what um, Persig taught us in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, quality can't be defined because it's too various. Um, it's, it's neglected by scholars, art historians, for example. They, they don't often talk about quality in painting, sculpture, and architecture because they know that historically standards have changed, tastes have changed, and they're not sure whether it's subjective or objective. Um, famously, the 
figure of truth on the ceiling of the Sheldonian theatre um, was described by a fellow of Merton in a long poem, only the last two lines are memorable, um, describing street as truth, um, this Robert Whitehall says, future ages must confess they owe to Streeter more than Michelangelo. Um, you can say that if you've never seen Michelangelo. If you have seen Michelangelo, you realize that Streeter isn't quite up to that standard. So quality varies. It's not objective. And therefore, um, the alternative which we have today is that it's subjective. And Again, Persick said it's, it's not subjective or objective, and when we are wrapped up in a good book, we don't feel self-conscious. We lose ourselves in a book, that's what we say. If you're caught up in a wonderful film or a play, um, you're not cons aware of subject and object. Subject and object dissolve in the experience of quality. Um, so this is what he says, when the subject becomes aware of the object, quality describes the relationship that binds them. It is not one thing or the other, it's when the two come together that you have the quality experience. And that's why you can't pin it down on one side or the other. And he then goes on to say, it's not a thing. It is an event, it is an occasion. Um, when you're wanting your coffee for breakfast, the aroma of freshly ground coffee may be mm, marvellous and you've had your coffee and you've had your breakfast and then you smell coffee again and it's the last thing you want. Um, you've moved on from that particular moment. It is a particular event. And this I, I found Persig's most useful statement. Um, quality is the response of an organism to its environment. Every organism has to exist in a physical environment and if it succeeds it finds nourishment, it avoids danger and it reproduces and quality describes that relationship to the environment. The organism responds not to truth or falsehood because that's a symbolic form of notation, it responds to the good and bad and quality contains the good and the bad. And this is, again, Persig, art is high-quality endeavor. The way I like to put it, art is any activity that can be done well or badly, and the art lies in doing it well. And once you've established that, many of the problems that attend our understanding of art and the history of art fall away. So, we go back to um, Socrates um, on trial for his life, in his defense, and this is the translation that came across to um, Western Europe in the Renaissance. Um, Marsilio Ficino is the first person to translate Plato into Latin, the, the complete works that is. And he said, if I say that the greatest good for a man is to, is to discuss quality every day, and you can see the Greek there, peri arites tus logus poiestai, um, Ficino put that into Latin, de virtute verba facere, um, to make words every day, exactly what the Greek says. Um, that is where the word virtue was introduced to, for our understanding of arete, and that is what's made um, the Socratic dialogues opaque to us. Um, see it as quality and they become clear. Now, the word um, virtue has a history a little bit like the word arete. This is how Julius Caesar uses virtue. He's talking about an encounter in the beginning of the Civil War. Um, about 70 of our men were killed in the first engagement. Amongst them, Quintus Fulginius, the leading centurion of the 14th Legion, who had been raised from the lower orders on accounts of his outstanding courage, is the penguin translation, but virtutem um, is what um, Caesar wrote. And quality, again, I think is a good translation. It's not just courage, it is skill, it's the ability to command, to um, retain the respect of his men and his peers. All those qualities um, made an ordinary legionary um, become a leading centurion. Um, and then the word virtue is transferred to painting. Um, this is Pliny's Natural History is our main source of ancient painting. He's talking about um, the Roman general who sacked Corinth in 146 BC um, and selling off the booty 
um, they sold a painting for 600,000 denarii. And the price surprised Mumius, who suspecting there must be some virtue, quality in the picture, of which he was himself unaware, had the picture called back and um, placed it in, made it public property. And um, quality, again, I think works very well for virtutis. And in the Renaissance, um, my own home ground, um, Giorgio Vasari's Lives of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors and Architects is our um, key reference. Um, the one thing that Vasari cares about above all others is virtu. And for years it's been regarded as almost untranslatable. We don't have an equivalent for it. Um, but he says um, he doesn't have the category art. Um, he, he can't refer to his masters or his artificers as, as artists because that's not the culture. And the general word art doesn't mean painting, sculpture and architecture. So he has to try and find out what do they have in common. And he decides it's drawing that they have in common. I say then that sculpture and painting are in truth sisters, born from the, the one father which is disegno at one and the same birth, and have no precedence one over the other, except inasmuch as the quality and force of those who practice them make one artificer surpass another. The quality is what he's trying to teach us in his lives of the most excellent painters. And if you can detect quality in a work of art, you are a virtuoso. It's a word that's used not only for the virtuoso practitioner, but for the connoisseur who can make quality judgments. That is what um, Vasari is trying to teach us. Well, um, we're supposed to finish at 11 o'clock. I'm clattering on because I want to show you some examples. I'm sure you're, you've seen enough text and you want to have some examples. Um, my examples I'm, I'm going to draw are actually from architecture, which don't have some of the issues that attend painting and sculpture. So this is um, street of ceiling. Um, the um, detail which shows architecture with the Corinthian capital, um, the plumb line you can see, um, if I find my mouse, there's the plumb line, and there's the um, set, set square, set square, architect square. Um, if you were to look closely at these faces, I don't think you would say that Strita is as good as Michelangelo, would you? He's got a formula. He applies a formula. He, he paints the darks, and then he adds the mid-tones, then he adds the high to highlights, and it works very well. No doubt he, he could work at speed. And he's very keen to show off his skill at foreshortening, so you look up um, the nostrils of some of his figures or see the underside of their feet, and that's all well and good. Um, but if you have a higher, ref a higher standard as a reference point, um, he doesn't compete. So in the field of architecture, um, how do we form judgments? Well, Vitruvius is our only ancient writer on architecture, a Roman architect living in the late first century BC. Um, he's probably read Greek textbooks <coughs> which are inaccessible to us, that, that have long disappeared, and he's borrowed these three principles. And Vitruvius writes, architecture must be conducted according to the principles of firmitas, utilitas, and venustas, solidity, utility, and beauty. Um, once you read it, it makes sense, doesn't it? Um, a building has to be solid. It has to withstand um, wind and rain. It has to be a useful building. The rooms have to be arranged in a useful way, so the kitchens and the um, bathrooms are useful, or in a public building, the, the health and safety regulations are satisfied. And it has to be beautiful. If it's not beautiful, it's a building, but it's not architecture. The very word architecture, um, from the Greek archon and tecton, archon is a master, tecton is building. Um, Nicholas Pevsner famous made the distinction um, between architecture and building. He says, a bicycle sh he said, a bicycle shed is a building, um, Lincoln Cathedral is a piece of architecture. Lincoln Cathedral has um, a range of references that bring it into the realm of beauty as well as um, being 
uh, solid, it's withstood wind and rain for many centuries, and within the context of um, Christian faith and a, a, as a great cathedral, um, it has its utility too. I have to say that um, bicycle sheds are useful too, and I once found an architectural award um, for a, an Australian architectural practice, they won an award for a bicycle shed. So if you design a really substantial I mean, uh, uh, a bicycle shed that is useful, that does its job and is beautiful, that also becomes architecture. Well, um, on your sheet you will see that I've got a few um, examples and I want to keep things as simple as possible. So I'm referring to columns, not just columns, but the basis of columns. This is the um, temple um, at Horiuji in, in Nara in Japan. It dates from about 700 um, AD, we're told. Um, it's a fascinating temple in many re respects. Um, architectural historians and historians of religion would have a lot to say about it. Um, it has a social function, it has a religious function, it has a cultural function. There are um, an awful lot of angles you could approach it uh, by to appreciate it. But what struck me looking at these timber columns, they're resting on stone bases and presumably those stone bases are acting as a damp course. Um, wood will rot if it's allowed to be damp for long periods, so putting it on a stone base um, stops it rotting. Um, but to my surprise when I was looking at this, the stones didn't seem to be flat. They were irregular bases. And when you think about it, um, that poses a challenge to the carpenter who's erecting the post because the post has to sit firmly on the base. If you have one brick resting directly on another brick, those bricks could be touching just on three points and that meant that there would be stresses in the brick and the point of mortar, we're told, is not to stick bricks together, it's to keep them apart so that the entire surface of one brick should be resting on the entire surface of the brick below. If you have an irregular base, how do you get the base of the timber post to fit it exactly? And I don't know and I hope I've not um, misinterpreted this. I looked at there were other parts of this um, wonderful temple which had bases and they all seem to be irregular to me. I don't know how it was done, but presumably there is an art to doing it. <coughs> and um, a master, a Japanese master craftsman, a carpenter, um, must have worked out a way of doing it and passed it on to his apprentice, apprentices. And so it became a tradition, a, a living tradition. Um, the architecture, the master building of these columns must have involved knowing how to erect a post on an irregular base so that it sat firmly on that irregular base. This is to do with, it has to be upright to be solid, um, it has to be um, useful, it has to be solid and it should be handsome. Well, um, the Greeks have the same problem. Um, Greek architecture, in, the, the forms of Greek architecture were all established when they, they built in timber. None of those have survived, but the timber structures are petrified, if you like, in the stone temples that were built from 600 onwards. Now this is the remains of the archaic temple of Hera on the island of Samos. When you see these columns re-erected, they've been re-erected by archaeologists. The um, column drums are lying scattered around and they just pile one up um, on top of the other to give us a feel of the scale of the original temple. And look at the base of these columns. Um, you have two bases, if you like, a separate piece of stone um, with a base that is concave in profile and it has these grooves very precisely cut. <coughs> Um, and then above that, the, the base of the column, of the shaft rather, it has a convex um, profile and a slightly different sequence of grooves. And the precision with which these grooves are marked is very striking. 
Um, the Greek word cosmos was applied to um, the, 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 the whole, the universe, by Pythagoras, we are told. And Pythagoras, of course, came from Samos. Um, and the word cosmos meant order, and it also meant beauty. If, if you have your phalanx of fighters fighting in order, that is cosmos. It has both order and it has beauty. And our modern word cosmetics comes from the same root. It's how you arrange your face um, so that it should show off to best advantage. Um, the Greeks, unlike the Japanese, had a completely flat surface and then they had their own damp course, which is this base, and they worked it so that it could be completely regular. And perhaps their um, reference was a pot turned on a, on a wheel, which gives you a perfectly um, circular outline, and you can paint grooves on it, not grooves, but you could paint um, bands on it, and this maybe was transferred to stone. Um, now, I remind you, um, Pythagoras comes from Samos. This is the famous um, discovery by Pythagoras that the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square on the other two sides. Vitruvius refers to this and he says this is the way you demonstrate it. You, do, you don't need to demonstrate it with numbers, you demonstrate it with geometry. And you just count up the squares and you can see that um, there are 25 on the hypotenuse, you add up the other two and it also comes to 25. And Vitruvius said that um, Pythagoras was so overwhelmed by this discovery that he sacrificed an ox um, to the god who must have given him the insight. Um, Vitruvius also um, talks about how do you double a circle. He says you can't do it mathematically I mean, with numbers. Um, because if you were to extend the, a square in a certain direction, you won't get to, this, to the same number of units um, on a double-sized square than you will of a single-sized square. But you can do it easily, geometrically, by taking a diagonal of the square and making that the, the size of your new square, which is going to be double the size of the old. So the Greek obsession with geometry could have been um, fired off by the architects who were building these Greek temples in stone and using geometry, because we know that they wrote books about their temples, and what, were, what are they going to write in their books if it's not the geometry that was involved in um, shaping the, the columns and the capitals and the entablatures that we see. And the other thing that strikes you uh, about Greek architecture is that it's optimized to be seen from a particular position. This is obviously the Acropolis in Athens, seen from the site of assembly. Now, I don't know whether Socrates was tried by his 501 jurors from this location, but when you look from the assembly to the Acropolis, you're looking exactly along the axis to the propyleon, um, the gate to the um, Acropolis. And the Parthenon is seen um, from the short end and you just see a certain amount of the, of the long end. And the little temple of Athena Nike you can see at a slight angle. It all looks exactly right. And I can't help, see, I can't imagine that this is a coincidence. This surely is the optimal view. And I'm astonished that uh, this doesn't seem to be the view that's very often photographed. I had to use one of my own Kodachrome slides to scan in to show you this because I couldn't find it anywhere else. <coughs> So it's a relationship, the classical Greeks, a relationship with the viewer and the object. They adjusted the shape of large statues so that they should look good from an acute angle. And you look at the column bases in the Propyleon. Um, these are Doric. Um, Doric columns don't have bases because they rest on a stone stylobate, um, the, the top step of the platform. And if that stylobate is, is stone, you don't need a damp course because the damp course is already there in the stone. Um, wonderfully precisely constructed. This is a beauty that was um, worked out in wood and then preserved in stone because that is, was a tradition which they respected. And just inside the Propyleon, you can see that they are Ionic bases, and these are the Athenian-style um, bases which become classic. 
um, you can see that the lower half has got a convex profile, that's the, um, the torus, Vitruvius gives us the terms, the, the concave, the scotia and the torus again, the lower one extending a little bit further out from the upper one, the upper one here has grooves, the lower one doesn't. This becomes such a, such a satisfactory formula that it has been repeated ever since. Um, it is a classic because it seems to be expressive of its function. You would feel that the weight of that column is squeezing out <laughs> the, um, the base as if it was some kind of um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Some sort of plastic material that is yielding to, to the pressure of the weight above it and that seems exactly right. Um, and then I'm switching to um, Normandy in the Middle Ages. Um, this is the Abbey Church of Bernay, which dates from the 11th century, very early stone church. Um, very simply cut, as you can see, but it isn't just building, it is architecture, because you have a pier on the right, so this is clearly a half column, and you have a base. Now, however simply it's cut, the master masons who were doing this had clearly looked at Roman um, structures and were borrowing Roman forms. And the Roman forms told them that a column had a base. And so that's what they've inserted there. And having mastered how to do this, the next generation of masons would have wanted to improve on their masters. And this is the dynamic, I think, of artistic traditions. You want to achieve quality. You are striving to do something better than as well as you can. You're striving for excellence. So over a couple of centuries, um, generations of Norman Masons must have worked on similar projects like this. So by the time we come to the cathedral in Coutances in the 13th century, you have these clusters of shafts um, terminating at these um, very expressive bases on little um, flat platforms like, a, like an abacus and raised on a much higher um, pedestal. There is a richness and a complexity to this and a logic to it. Each of these shafts spreading out for the ribs for the vaulting above, which is very rewarding. And no doubt contemporaries seeing this would have had the earlier um, bases as their reference point, so they would have admired the excellence, the quality which they see here, and every bishop wanted his cathedral to stand out um, against the competition. And then we sh switch to the 15th century, this is the choir of the Abbey Church at Mont Saint-Michel, um, in hard granite, very hard stone to work, and you can see blocks of granite have been assembled together and this extraordinary complex moulding has been applied across the various blocks. So you have um, convex, concave, then come into a ridge, then a little um, platform, then a, a round moulding above that, and then the base of the shafts with all sorts of embellishments and enrichment to it that generations of masons have added um, to impress their clients and impress their um, contemporaries. It is quality that's driving what they do. And I think every artistic tradition works like this. You go from early simplicity to sophistication to great complexity and it becomes so complex that the next generation gives up and starts again doing something rather different. Um, just to give you a quick glimpse of the overall church, very simple Abbey Church of Bernay, that was the first one. Um, very complex um, 13th century Gothic with flying buttresses and um, large windows. And the magnificent choir of the Abbey Church of Mont Saint-Michel. This is the early Romanesque church you can see on the left and the 15th century choir added to it. Now, um, I return to Plato. Plato, if you like, is the person who introduced the mystery. Um, Plato and Socrates' absolute value is not truth. Even though they are seeking for truth, their value is arete. This is what um, Socrates was questing for. Um, 
all his interrogations of the poets and the sophists and the rhetoricians was asking them what quality was. And a simpler word they use is the good. And they use the word good as a noun, not as an adjective, as a, as a good dinner or a good lecture or a good whatever. They, they talk about the good. And in the Republic, um, Socrates is challenged to tell people what the good is. And he says, it's too difficult to say what, what the good is, um, but I can say what it's like. And he has this famous image of the cave. And if you Google Plato's cave, you come up with all sorts of nasty illustrations of it. Um, this is a, an illustration dating from about 1600, um, in which um, the image of the good and the light is um, conflated with St. John's Gospel. This is actually from John's Gospel. Lux venit in mundum et delixerunt homines magis tenebras quam lucem something. Um, light came into the world and men preferred darkness to the light. Um, so that's Christianizing the story. But um, Plato's narrative has the many, the, the, the populace, us if you like, um, in this dark cave looking at shadows on the wall and that is our um, experience of the, the world of the senses. We're just looking at shadows of the real. Um, philosophers are actually in a bit more light than the rest of us and they see the originals which are generating the shadows. But if you study for 15 years philosophy you can actually get out of the cave and then you're in the sunlight. And in the sunlight you see truth. You see the world and when you first get out there it's so blazing that you, you're blinded but you, at night you will see the night sky and you will wonder at its beauty and then when the sun comes up um, you will see truth but the source of truth is the sun and the sun is his image for the good um, this is where truth gets truth from um, truth here the, the arts and sciences on the Sheldon scene are looking to truth. Where does truth get truth from? He gets it from the good, and the good in Plato's image is the sun. The good, the value of good and bad, is primary. Um, truth is our symbolic notation of it, which works very well in mathematics and logic and um, some subjects, but in the here and now, um, the good and bad is our, our guide to getting through life. Um, from the moment you wake up to the moment you sit down in the lecture, or even where you sit in the lecture, you're judging what is a good and bad place to sit. Um, that is fundamental and of overriding importance. Right, thank you very much. Um, I've, we've got ten minutes before our coffee break, so if there are any questions, this is a very good time to take them. <laughs>